The following podcast is brought to you by the Ebb Tide Treatment Center. Many people wrestle with addiction. You don't have to. Reach out to the Ebb Tide Treatment Center, where they wish to empower each individual encountered with the support, hope, and tools required for long-term sobriety. Priding themselves on providing the best possible treatment experience for you and your loved ones based on unique needs. They're committed to breaking the stigma that plagues those suffering with addiction and their families by educating and bringing awareness to the community. The Ebb Tide Treatment Center provides individual and group therapy, multiple recovery pathways for support, evidence-based clinical support, integrated aftercare social reintegration, personalized treatment planning, program addressing whole life health and Vivitrol program all available. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, reach out to them at EBB tide tc.com or call 440-4357. Hello once again, everybody, and welcome to another edition of AIW's The Card is Going to Change. Before we get into today's topic and episode, of course, a shout out to all of our sponsors that help us bring this to you for free each and every week. Thanks to Angelo's Pizza as we sit around this right now and we enjoy some delicious meals from them. You too can enjoy Angelo's Pizza when you come out to the AIW live events at Mount Carmel. And if you can't make it to one of those or you want to try something other than their award-winning pizza, head to Angelo's on Madison Avenue in Lakewood, Ohio. Thanks, of course, to Smart Mark Video that helps us bring all of the live events to you on digital or DVD forms. You can watch them back. You can watch through all of old AIW shows from the past. Head to smartmarkvideo.com to purchase any one of those past shows. And, of course, we want to thank Jack Prince that takes care of all of our graphic and design needs. They can do the same for you, whether it's t-shirts, banners, business cards, literally anything that you could think of, head to jackprince.com and they will have all of those through there for you. Browse the catalog. And once again, that's jackprince.com. J-A-K prince.com. That's right. And don't forget to use promo code absolute 2 CLE to save up to $75 off your order. Oh, all right. Those voices you heard first was the president of AIW, Matt Wadsworth, and the second, of course, as always, the staple here on the show, AIW owner John Thorne. My name is Steve Guy, your moderator of sorts. And on today's episode, uh, this has kind of been uh, by request. People have wanted us to talk about this topic. It's been touched on through various episodes, one of which was the AIW Origins episode featuring Matt Wadsworth. That's why he's here with us today. And we are going to get into the history that essentially led up to AIW. So this, once again, an origin story for you guys, but... uh, some of it's going to be the John Thorne origins, but mostly it's just it's the AIW origins, if you will. And yeah, I don't know. This might end up breaking down into uh, multiple episodes. We'll have to see how it goes here today because there's so many kind of different avenues that we could potentially get you know drawn down when discussing uh, this long weird history. I mean, I was not involved in the history, as most people know or realize. Uh, so this is going to be fun for me as I hear about and learn about it. I've heard some stories in passing, uh, but we're going to, we're going to bring it all to you guys here today. And I think it starts, um, so let's touch on first. I think the biggest thing is this is independent wrestling and an era that was because of our age, you know, we weren't in the internet prevalent world. How do you guys discover independent wrestling i'll probably throw that one to you wadsworth (laughs) well technically the the first independent wrestling show that i can think of that we ever went to is the the one at the brooklyn rex was uh we've talked about here on the show and we talked about in my origin and and chandler biggins origin and we've talked about sep sports entertainment productions the local cable access show that 
that through the years has kind of become a feeder system for for AIW for and a, uh, independent wrestling as a whole around here. <laughs> yeah, just kind of like like honestly, I don't even know how much of this show is on YouTube or exists, but for some reason it has such weird direct ties to local Cleveland wrestling. Well, and it was it, the the kind of catchphrase that I had coined that they they co opted was it was it was pro wrestling without the wrestling aspect. Right. It was wrestling storylines, wrestling feuds, but then you you'd finish it in a hot dog eating contest or arm wrestling. It's yeah, this, this was weird. the show that Biggins was on. Yeah, yeah. So oh. early on in it, oh, I was on it one a few times too. Oh. I once <laughs> I once lip synced crisscross jump when I was like eleven years old on this show. <laughs> <laughs> early What's, on what it. station was this on oh, i was just local, whatever yeah, i was local access? cable access <laughs> um but they uh put my clothes on backwards and everything with my, even before with my neighbor lino bartolozzi even before <laughs> i was on the show um the early years it started out as uh like local ice skating at the rec center their friday night entertainment something to do during the friday night open skate and one of the guys on it was uh, Lou Marconi, who had just started out wrestling. He was a Brooklyn guy. I guess that probably explains why it, it's so closely tied to independent wrestling, because one of the earliest cast members was Beef Stew Lou Marconi. Was, oh, and, and they did. He had gotten involved in feuds, and he decided he had just broken into wrestling, and I guess decided he wanted to try to bring it to the show. So he brought Frank Stiletto onto the show with him. I mean, this is we're going way back. We're so, going. like, a lot of people aren't going to recognize these names, but handsome Frank Stiletto, local legend. But they uh, they feuded. He had tights that the, just said "handsome" on them. They they <laughs> culminated know with a summer event, their big summer event at the rec center, and they had I think two matches on it. They had those two, and then uh, Thunder Morgan and Kenny Hendricks. Who is Kenny Hendricks? Still active. Still active. Yeah, I still see him every really? now and then on car. He was on a recent UXWA show, tagging with Razor Sharp. And this is, I mean, Kenny, we're talking mid 90s. Yeah, this, this was this was over 20 years ago. Has at this to be point. like 1994. Or he was 95. probably in his 20s at that point. Uh, yeah, probably. Wow. But uh, so but, that's that's probably the first like it kind of uh, I guess taste of independent wrestling we but didn't know that's any you better. guys just being fans at that point yeah we were so that's me like probably being like 10 years old at yeah. that show like or 11 years I, old. realistically yeah and then do you keep up with it that at that point no. you just no I, not at all like uh from from that you know then it's just kind of like uh wrestling wrestling you know what i mean Rest, just wwf wrestling or whatever right and then i think we had a handful of independent shows after that well we discovered ecw and uh we go to we start going to ecw house shows and uh, you know uh, wadsworth he was his family was very like uh, computer and technically savvy so they had like a website for their family in like 1996 or something yeah and like a family website yeah, yeah that my my dad and my cousins and my brother <laughs> bought the the, dom- the domain name and it was just shared amongst the family yeah like they had like their own like family tree website or whatever all right uh, and this is like infant like very infancy of the internet like yeah super like early on dial up cleveland freenet days and uh he had, uh, you know, like a bio- like everyone had their own biography or whatever. And like on his biography, he said he liked wrestling. And some dude just like sends him a cold email and is like, I see you like wrestling, man. Do you want to come? <laughs> and it was it was wrestling combined with I had done the Ohio State Fair Choir and he had done it. And now he was an independent wrestler. So he liked wrestling, too. So he was like, come check out the show. We got a school. Wow. It was I was. I had to have just been 18 at the time. Yeah. So, so like, it is, I remember his name was Talon. I remember it because I caught his T-shirt that he threw into the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so he says, hey, come to this show. And we don't, you know, we don't know that much about independent wrestling at all. Right. And uh, we go to this show and it's being promoted by a guy named Bubba the Stompin' Hillbilly. I'm probably 14 years old. Uh he, you know, he's probably sixteen or seventeen, and because he could drive. Yeah, I, I was old enough to drive us out there at the time. And like, you know, we're going out there and with our map quests, and uh, 
you know, it's just some show. The Bouncer was on the show. I remember that. The Bouncer. The of, Bouncer. Of UXWA Tag Team Championship. Oh, not the fame. Bouncer from the venue. No, the Bouncer, no, the wrestler. The actual wrestler out of yeah. Youngstown, Ohio. He yeah. was on it. Uh, Lou Marconi and Frank Stiletto were on it. And I remember a guy had a WWF logo tattoo on it, and I thought he was the coolest. Well, but his name was Mr. Saturday Night. And Greg well, Valentine was then. advertised for it, but wasn't there. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's just a show, whatever. And then there, Frank Stiletto tells us, to come out to his show in a week because they were laughing at the idea that Bubba had a school that they were trying to recruit me to <laughs> right so then we go to his show and uh the, the following week it was the night after an ECW house show and you know they have like the pit bulls and the bushwhackers and like Stevie Richards Mike Quackenbush and like uh reckless and, uh, Tom Brandy reckless youth uh, Adam, Joey Matthews, Christian York, yeah, Adam like, Pierce, all these people that like go on to be these like huge independent wrestling names. Yeah. but there's like at the time we didn't know that right. it was looking back, it was an absolutely loaded independent show. Yeah, like Julio, Julio, Julio De Niro was De Niro. there, uh, Cue Ball Carmichael. So like, but there's like you know 13 people in the crowd there's or something. Nobody there, like, and we're like, wow, this is this is weird, but fuck, man, I'm, the Bushwhackers are here. This is sweet, which leads to one of my favorite moments. Yeah. Of independent wrestling for us ever. Yeah, they licked my face, dude. They we were <laughs> we were standing there. We were trying to get. We didn't even care about them. We were trying to get Stevie Richards to come over and say, "Hey." He came walking over, stood by us at the guardrail, and started screwing around, yelling for the Bushwhackers. One of them, they come by. One of them grabs John and just licks his head. There you go. And Stevie Richards almost fell over laughing. He was like, "I can't believe they just fucking licked your head, dude." <laughs> Yeah, well, now I know a little bit more about the Bushwhackers, but you know, <laughs> then I thought it was awesome. Now I don't know. If, <laughs> now I don't know if I'd be having them lick my head. Now you don't know so much, huh? Yeah, yeah. but uh, so from there, we kind of that that show kind of gets us hooked on independent wrestling, and we start, you know, following a lot of those guys like Reckless Youth and stuff. You just kind of keep in contact with them, and like, hey, where are you guys? Or looked them up, or just, just, yeah, we would just up. look them up. You know, I don't even know what what there was like uh, Yahoo or something. Well, like, yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I mean, I'm trying to think back. I don't even know how you it was uh, how you promote that other than flyering back then. It was yeah, that was t- the TV commercials, like so unlike the public access. No, like uh, no, you'd buy from the local cable company. Oh yeah, yeah. so you you'd still do that spend now? Yeah, directly local. And you'd say, hey, how much would it run me to, to run an ad during Raw? Yeah. So, you know, like, from, that's got to be expensive. That's, I mean, I mean most of those got to be like late at night. We're talking, no, it was like during Raw. Like, really? But it was, pri- yeah, I, I mean, it was prime dollar to run an, an indie commercial during Raw. But I remember, so this is like late 90s. And then, you know, from there, like, you know, we just start looking for shows. Like, we start going to, you know, shows and seeing Jimmy Superfly Snooka, like, yeah. in the ghetto of Cleveland somewhere. Or, like, uh, Al Snow had, like, a school, but then, like, I think his school, like, broke away from actually yeah, Al he, Snow. Yeah, he was done training, I think, by then, but, but they started running they shows. Would do sho- they would do shows. Or Like, in the late 90s, there was a lot of wrestling in Cleveland that people, that's probably forgotten about. So, like... I remember going and, like, I saw, like, Sick Nick Mondo's first match ever. He wrestled this guy named Cody X. Scott Stone uh, at Twinsburg High School. Like, I'll forget, like, so many things about AIW and, like, wrestling, but, like, these, like, memories I'll I'll always remember because it's, like, before you're really involved in wrestling, you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. when you're going as a fan. Um, but, like, you would... Kid l- Copper Pot. Yeah, you would learn a lot about these shows because... They would just buy like a buy like a one commercial during Raw, and you would have to like, you know, like most of the time I'd be recording Raw or something, so I like I'd rewind and like I'd be like, oh man, Dad, can you That's take me to this wrestling show? Yeah, yeah. Is this going on over this here? era sounds more like if I could draw the comparison or parallel for people who obviously didn't experience it. Um, you know, like if you ever seen the movie, if you ever seen The Wrestler with mm-hmm. Mickey Rourke, it's much like that movie is much more similar to that time frame as opposed to anything remotely close to what you'd be going to now. Kind of, yeah. Because, I mean, the the internet was out there because I was, as a result of us having computers, I was on the internet, but you didn't get a ton from advertising. Like, you had Usenet news groups at the time. You didn't have these full web pages or or Facebook or stuff like that where everybody was using it. Yeah, Yeah, there was no social media or anything. Like, it, it was, like, total, like... Like I said, either like a commercial or like you got a flyer or you know what I mean? Like you went to a show and 
you listened for that announcement for where where the next one was going to be. Yeah, maybe a local newspaper, I guess, mm, would work potentially. Probably not. But no. but when I say that, I mean like maybe like local local. So like you say, Twinsburg, they have the Twinsburg Bulletin. There. Yeah, but like, I wasn't I living. That. Yeah, but that's what yeah. I mean. Like it would be for the people who live directly in that it, town, and that's probably about it. And like you know, I remember seeing guys like fucking like uh, what's a tugboat? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, Tugboat was on a Who was set up show. next to us at WrestleCon. You know? Very nice guy. He uh his wife was wonderful too. And that show was we got tricked into that one. We didn't realize all we knew was it was law and something else, and Tugboat was advertised, or Typhoon was advertised. And we went and we were sitting there for a little bit, and finally one of the guys with us said, Hey, what does law stand for? And we realized that it was a women's show. But like pre girls night out area, it's not like today's women's wrestling right. where there's going to be a bunch of action. Yeah. It was like glow era women's <laughs> wrestling. <Yeah. laughs> it was not a very good. And then they just had randomly typhoon there, and this company decided to toss a little pyro on the ring, and they had pyro going off inside of this high school. What? I mean, there was like it was like the wild west in the in the late nineties. But from there, we just like decide like, oh, we're just gonna we're just gonna run an independent wrestling show. And, uh, and that's what kind of gives birth then to EIW. Yeah, which we talked about a lot more on his episode, which yeah. is, you know, just the highlights were like, uh, which I there is a lot expelled. to talk about. There were two shows. <laughs> I almost got expelled from high school because <laughs> Columbine happened like that week. As right. we're advertising. And I was advertising, advertising like teenage violence. So, like, they thought I was like running the like local chapter of the Trenchcoat Mafia. Uh, at my school, and I had a lot of questions to answer, <laughs> and I was like, "I'm just trying to do like a, a pro wrestling, like on TV." And they're like, "I don't know." <laughs> but from there, we got hooked up with like another group of guy, like guys uh, who were huge fans of this fucking SCP local access show, which was EFW, which they had run like two or three shows at that point. Yeah, they were they were running a little VFW hall down the street from. From actually where right we here were yeah from right here <laughs> and, and there's not a lot of history on efw out there i did find there's the angel fire website well again uh, which has nothing on it basically i mean you're talking late at this point we're getting into the late 90s like 98 99 99 you know? 2000 yeah. the what we were talking about before is the like the companies that hosted the web a most of us didn't have websites right B, the companies that hosted those websites are long out of business. But you so guys, there isn't much history out there for that. Not to like give you guys props or kudos. Like I'm not trying to spin it that way. But at the same time, you guys are kind of in that early adoption of people throughout the country because where we're talking right now, the attitude era is basically just hitting. And that's, and that's what blows up wrestling. But you guys right. are kind of getting into this right before or well, during I, I mean that's what was so crazy about the attitude era is you could just have a flyer and it would just say wrestling with an address yeah and, and people like, showed up there'd be 500 people there like right it, like easily so like efw would essentially the business plan was this it was this, this guy his name was john rotten he was like uh, I, I think he's the same age as Wadsworth or maybe like a yeah, year younger. Yeah, within a year. But uh, basically his, you know, his scheme or whatever, his deal was, is, you know, he somehow just gets with JT Lightning as a teenager, you know, and JT lets him, JT, what JT used to do is you could just go and pay him 10 bucks a person on like a weeknight and you could just play in his ring. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? And like train yourself or fuck around yourself. He didn't care. Uh, and then screw it. He, it was set up already. He was yeah. already paying rent. It's and it's just like- 10 bucks a person, whoever wanted to go, you know? And then these guys were like training themselves or fucking around themselves or whatever. Like, we're going to run our own show with our, with our friends. And then, so they did. And they, you know, it's just teenagers, you know what I mean? It's untrained. And then what this John Rotten guy did was then as you know, you get the driving age and you start meeting different people, he started befriending people from different high schools. Uh So then, oh yeah, I like wrestling. Okay. Well, you want to be a wrestler? Like, yeah. Okay. So now you're in EFW. So now, well, this was, this was the boom of backyard wrestling. So he almost, it almost became like this Mecca for backyard wrestlers because, Hey man, they're in a building with yeah, a ring, a real ring with yeah. fans there. So what what he started doing was 
is he started renting JT's ring and renting like real venues. And then it would just be all these, all the quote unquote wrestlers were just from different high schools. So like they would sell tickets to everyone in their high school. Well, sure. And then like, this guy would sell tickets to everyone in his high school. And then before you knew it, like these shows were drawing like 900 people completely <laughs> untrained, like legit 900 people. And yeah. not, not one person was trained. JT would either, if you rented his ring, you, he either wrestled the match against one of his students or he would ref and then like try to help the guys like that not were kill wrestling themselves. because yeah. like, Nobody knew what the fuck was going on. And like, this is like ECW. So everyone's like era. Everyone's wanting to use weapons and like all the, right. all like the things, like the bad stereotypes that are remembered of, of, of ECW wrestling and ECW. Like that's like what was going on here. And, uh, but it was, it was working. You know what I mean? And like, I was, you know, fif- 15 years yeah, old. I was going to say, you're not even 18 yet. No, like most of the people were not 18. Like I, I would it, say yeah, Wads- Wadsworth started. was on the higher end of the age spectrum. When we started, it would have been, you know, I would have just just hit there. Your your Josh and Matt were my age, so they would have just hit there. Yeah, I guess that's but, like I guess that's EIW's claim to fame is we were the first people to put Josh Prohibition and M Dog Matt Cross in a wrestling ring for the first time, <laughs> and a lot of that footage was on the best the backyard wrestling VHS tape. Which I think we talked about on Watchers yeah, episode. My, yeah. It's where JT discovered them. That's how they ended up going it and trained. And that's what that's kind of how all of this t- almost ties into to Cleveland wrestling is what happened is JT started kind of almost cherry picking guys, right? He you know he was like, well, he's, this guy kind of knows what he's doing. He's got a little bit of know how and he's got and some he, talent. You know, he's got some athleticism. Yeah. He since he was at the shows anyways, he'd say, hey, do you want to come train? Yeah, and like you know, there were guys that were good or like more, I guess, students of of the mechanics of wrestling versus guys that were just like wanting to say that they were a wrestler to their high school friends, you know? So JT would like grab guys like, you know, Adam cage and Josh and Matt and different guys. Uh, but you know, these shows went on for years, like very successfully for years. How, how often were these shows happening? The EFW shows were like probably once a month, once a month, maybe a couple months in between. And like this John rotten guy, people don't understand. Like this guy was, probably far ahead of his time at being like a carny at the age of oh, 18 absolutely. like <laughs> cuz he only got better at it as he got older as we got into our 20s he like, was he was better and better at so, it so like there's like this there's there's this place now it's like a gigantic arena in the suburbs of Cleveland it's like it's in Strongsville it's called like like Ice USA or something yeah it's uh yeah so like i don't know what it's called but this is a giant arena well before some people bought it and like somehow this John Rotten guy convinces them to like give him a salaried position because like he's this wrestling promoter <laughs> and he's going to make it the exclusive EFW arena. Right. And then like, you know, they bought, they would buy us merchandise lines and like all this stuff. And they, they gave all, wow. you know, I wasn't even old enough to really have a job, but he gave all these different EFW people like salaried positions and like, uh, turn, then that falls apart because like, they realize their investment's going nowhere. Yeah, I'm saying because if you met most of the people that he gave salary jobs, chances are nothing productive was happening. But like, uh, so stuff like this is happening, and that, or like, you know, this guy, this guy gets Kent State University to like buy buy a show off of us, totally untrained, to run in their like basketball They're, arena. Yeah, the Mac Center. I don't know if that's still the name, but at the time it was the Mac Center. Yeah, I think so. And it was, it's you know. 15 20 000 seat college yeah, division right. one basketball just like arena some, just some teenagers rolling in like then a bunch of at this point 20 somethings i mean you still would have been your tween your teens but but a lot of us were early 20s at this point maybe like a and, couple maybe like not 21 It's Alex Worldwide Killer here to tell you all about the Thrift Store Jobber. At Thrift Store Jobber on Instagram, find him on Etsy, eBay, and he's got a doozy of a deal for you. It's the Legion of Doom. That's right, Hawking Animal in all their glory in that WWF run straight out of 1992. It is a size medium shirt. 
It's got all the colors of the rainbow. That's a lie. It's got a few colors. It's a colorful t-shirt on black. You should check it out. Size medium at Thrift Store Jobber on Instagram. Tell them, Thorn. Well, that's enough from you. At Thrift Store Jabber on Instagram, Etsy, etc. Use promo code WORLDWIDE to get 10% off your order. You've told the stories on the podcast before where you would book, you'd try to book names and they'd call your house. Well, right. So this is during the EFW times, but like, you know, just, just going like, I I guess EFW is to blame for kind of the, how, the, why I am the way I am. Oh, without a doubt it is. Because I am like young, the youngest person around all these guys. Right. And like, they're just doing all this cool fucking fun shit like i'm you know this kent state show i'm 16 some guys fucking scratching up a license and saying they're sneaking me into bars and i'm like 16 years old like drinking with these guys and like (laughs) you know what i mean like it's it's totally fucked up situation but you know there was all this money around and fucking you know we had hotel rooms like people thought you know people thought that we were like legit they figured out how to convince people they were a big deal do you do you think had wrestling not blown up in mainstream pop culture as much as it did right at that time that it would have been as successful uh with the high school plan yeah but as soon as everyone got out of high school yeah uh, you know as soon as everybody found a social life basically it went out the window it stopped being cool yeah but like uh, so like the high school thing i think would always work you know what i mean just because right. but uh you know as soon as everyone got older like the the crowd started going down and then it's like all right efw's efw's over because then you got people going to colleges and well, I mean, people just people aren't going to college. yeah, your group's not there as much anymore which, and we should probably throw out the disclaimer here so we don't get in trouble we're not condoning high school kids currently to start <laughs> their own uh wrestling federation and use use this business plan it was a product of its era i think <laughs> yeah i, I mean it really was the heyday of backyard wrestling 90s and stuff yeah. like that like you know that like that nowadays like it just it wouldn't fly but um, you'd get shot down before you could really get going, I think. Right. But yeah, we like, so, and I just want to throw out a little tidbit that the Duke would, uh, we would, we would claim that we were going to host open tryouts. <laughs> and, the, and not only did the Duke, I know I've busted his balls for bringing a film crew one time. The movie. That's how he got in, man. The movie. Well then that's how he discovered EFW and there was like wrestling around. Uh, and he saw these big crowds, but then the Duke would come to the open tryouts, and we would have untrained guys hosting open tryouts, and the Duke would be Put going the, through these fucking the Duke through the drills, these fucking <laughs> drills. Uh, but yeah, EFW toured a little bit too. Like we did shows like in all over the state and stuff. It's mind boggling to me that people would be doing business with teenagers. That they would just think like, yeah, sure, I, this is a total. I mean, these were thing. to their credit, these were really big guys. So like, you, okay, you would they weren't like you know like scrawny little teenagers. These guys were all like six four, six. Yeah, six. I mean that's that's the advantage they had, they had over the when we ran looks. EIW. It's exactly what you thought it was. Right. I mean, it was a bunch of little guys, smaller guys. I was one of the biggest guys there, and I'm all of five eleven at the time. You know, um, these guys for the most part could at least figure out how to look the part okay all right that's fair but yeah so like uh i guess this is kind of gives you a little bit you know there's a lot of people out there that don't you know that don't know any of this existed they were probably weren't barely even alive during you know this era but uh you know it, it was just a totally totally different time in in the world you know the for lack of a fucking better term i don't know how else to explain it no it absolutely i mean it's like i said it's a product of its era but you know, it, the combination of that the monday night wars the attitude era ecw and its heyday at the time so and then at what point do the names really start coming in like as we had talked about on a previous episode like i said uh towards like the last year of efw or we probably all got a little bit more egotistical yeah <laughs> and like <laughs> and there well because we had been drawing those crowds and there's money around you we, know you had some guys like m dog was still coming and working even though he was trained and he was getting booked other places right 
um and josh prohibition and, and like there was other guys like <laughs> like that were on the cusp that could have become like indie dudes that just it just didn't happen but like uh that were training or going to or like going to try to learn different things but we decided to try to go more legit and you know at this point we're kind of competing with all the other local independents which there was a lot in 1999 2000 there's probably 20 feds running the greater cleveland area i mean that's wild to think about and they they a lot of them resented these untrained you know jokes basically do you think there were so there were so many because again going back to it's that it's that time period it was that era yeah yeah. All you had to do was set up a ring and, and you get people because people wrestling there. was so huge in general. It was like, let's bring all these people right. in. And do you think, like, part of it too? I mean, my thought is without the internet being as big as it was as well, you know, you don't, if, if there's, there's no brand loyalty. That's what I'm saying. No, yeah, and yeah. it's like three of us sitting in a room and we're like, we should start a wrestling group because we have no idea this other wrestling group may even exist. I mean, if you like, not to sound like so prehistoric, but like, you know, it doesn't sound like it's that long ago. Yeah. But like, but just where at, everything was at this time period, there was a lot of wrestling shows that weren't even being videotaped, you know, or being right. filmed. Right? Or, yeah. There's these things weren't being post produced and and sold out there it was, for people to watch. Yeah, it and, was a one stop shop live show experience. That's it. And if you taped it, it was for your own personal use. The promoter, you know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, the promoter had that. But to to think of how to. Uh, replicate a videotape which i just thought of like a really funny story that kind of goes hand in hand with this era is uh a lot of like we said a lot of people you know like we went to ecw house shows and stuff and some people asked on twitter like talk about local ecw house shows i don't remember anything about a local ecw house show but the one thing i do remember is a guy that was involved with us his name was Rob Lover. Totally eighties. Rob Lover was his wrestling name. <laughs> he went on to be when after he got trained, he became Tyson Bishop. But uh, he wanted to make his own like knockoff RF video company, and he called it RL Video. And he would just buy tapes off the internet or eBay, <laughs> and he bought all these like uh, you know VHS duplicators and stuff, and he would he would try to be his own fucking like tape bootlegging business. Cause this was, this was the time where, you know, tape trading was, tape was trading huge was thing. And RF right. video was as big as they got. Yeah. Our video was gigantic. Cause they had all the ECW stuff. They had all the Japanese stuff. So Rob lover decides to start RL video in which, uh, I remember I found it somehow on AOL fucking, you know what I mean? You just looking at eBay, I found the mass transit tape, which was, that that was like that was the holy grail of urban legend in wrestling is New Jack cutting up this kid that was 17 years old mass transit at an ECW show the tape was taken off the market there was a lawsuit like a lot of people know the story well i found somebody was selling it on eBay or some fucking who knows what website in you know 2000 and i show rob lover that this tape is for sale so he buys it and he gets it and it's legit and we watch it so he starts duplicating this tape and then there's like some somebody throws this fucking local like they want to they try to make like a wrestle con in cleveland or something where it's like wrestling vendors and they bring in like a brutus beefcake or something okay well rl video is one of the uh <laughs> prominent vendors happening at this wrestling <laughs> convention that was at the brook park armory and his hot item is the mass transit tape and he's selling he sells quite a bit of it so Rob Lover and I, you know, ECW's coming to town. And the big thing when you, when ECW came to town is you always wanted to be first so you can get to the RF video table so you can buy some weird Japanese wrestling tape. Like, that was that was how we discovered Japanese wrestling. It yeah. was, you know, the best of Hayabusha, the best of Japanese death matches. Exploding rings, yeah. like strangle mania and all this stuff. So you wanted to go to ECW and be first so you could beeline for that table pick up whatever VHS tapes you're like, literally these are dubbed VHS tapes being sold for $20. Like this dude is probably still rolling in money of, off of that, uh, dollar VHS tape that he would sell for 20. But, uh, anyway, so we're waiting for front in line. You know what I mean? We're there at like 5 PM. The show doesn't doors aren't opening until like six 30 or something. We're the first people in line and like, you know, uh, Rob Feinstein and like, Atlas security come to the door 
and they pull Rob Lover inside the Agora and they tell me to stay out. And I'm like, whoa, what the fuck is going on, man? <laughs> like, are they going to book him? Do they know he's a wrestler? This is what I'm thinking. You know right. what I mean? As a 16 year old, like, like, this is awesome. And like, this is kind of what he's thinking. This is what he's thinking. You know what I mean? Because uh, like, our egos are so gigantic at the success of VFW at this time. You know what I mean? We think that he's getting an ECW tryout. So then all of a sudden, Atlas Security fucking is walking him out like by his collar. And, uh, you know, they're, they're like, you got to go. You got to go. So like, I just follow him because he drove. I didn't, I, was, right. I didn't even have a license at this time. And uh, he like, he doesn't even smoke. He doesn't say anything. We get in his car. He's not talking. He stops at a gas station. He buys a bag of cigarettes. He starts smoking cigarettes. And I'm like, dude, what is going on? He's like, I just got a lifetime ban. I was like, what do you oh mean? He's like, I've been banned from ECW for life. <laughs> and, and he's like, this is the worst day of my life because he's the biggest ECW fan. Yeah. And he's like, I'm banned for life because somebody went and told RF Video and Paul Heyman that I was reproducing the mass transit tape. And... I can no longer attend ECW for as long as I live. Well, ECW didn't last that much longer. It was like another two years at that point. (laughs) But yeah, I just thought of that random story for for some fucking reason. I wish Paul Heyman was sitting somewhere right now listening to this. Listening to this podcast. I remember that fucking guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if we get his side of the story, that'd be amazing. But uh, to go back to the names thing is, I, you know, there's all these companies or whatever, and that was really the crutch that they relied on was... That was the only thing that made them cooler was they had, like, some big former star. Well, and it was just after ECW closed. Right. So there was kind of a flood of those guys hitting the market. Yeah. Plus, like, well, at that time, you could book WWE, WWF, would, you could book, like, their talent. You know right, what I mean? Yeah. So, like, I remember, I think it was, like, you know, somebody's probably going to call bullshit on this, but... Like this John Rotten guy, he used to call WWF all the time. One time he pranked WWF as Marty Jannetty, and he got all the way up to like Kevin Kelly to get Marty Jannetty. Almost got job yeah, Marty Jannetty a job. Like th- <laughs> this is just the dumb shit that we used to do. But uh, like I, I remember he he had called about third and just was like third party bookings, please, because he you know he heard third party bookings was like a term, and then you know he started getting prices on guys. And I think for like 1500 bucks, like the Hardy, like the Hardy boys would wrestle each other on your show. Uh, so like we almost did that. I remember like when China got fired or quit WWF, whatever it was like we had, you know, we talked to her and then we ended up just booking ECW people cause we were huge ECW fans. Yeah. Cause it started with dreamer and he wasn't even booked to wrestle. He was going to be a ref. And Francine, we booked Francine. We somehow got Francine's phone number. Because, uh, we, well, because Dreamer was supposed to ref, and the one guy, Mike Stryker, was a huge Dreamer fan. So it was he was the special guest ref in this main event angle. Yeah, we were gonna run the Odeon downtown. Like it was gonna be this huge. Like we we're gonna run this, you know, big legit venue with Tommy yeah. Dreamer. And then, uh, which Tommy Dreamer did eventually make his way to the Odeon. Well, <laughs> and then a couple weeks before the show, we're <laughs> sitting around. At uh, at Harry Buffalo, I think watching Raw, and who should jump the guardrail and I head into it, the ring? I think it was Hooters probably at that time. <laughs> who should jump the guardrail and head to the ring? But Tommy Dreamer. At which point we went, um, "What's going on?" Yeah, because so, he's supposed to be working for us in a yeah. couple of weeks. So yeah, so Dreamer sends the Sandman, which that was a whole fucking experience. And then somehow we we like got a hold of New Jack. We started booking New Jack. We booked Chris Chetty because he was and still is my favorite wrestler of all time. Chris uh, Chetty versus uh, versus M Dog. Yeah, I'm sure that's on some like Matt Cross like compilation tape from like 2003 or something. Uh, we booked Don Marie. The Duke took her to dinner. Uh, <laughs> I I went to dinner with Francine. We had a nice steak. I was 16 years old, 17 years old. Well, and took her to another indie. Oh yeah, there we, was a, a an indie that they didn't like us that drew like crap at the time because we were kind of out of the boom a little bit at this point. Oh right, you, we talked about this on uh, I think your yeah, episode. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we took her and sat her in the crowd with her. We was just, we, we would just do all kinds of fucked up shit, just vindictive stuff. But then you know, so we booked all these names and stuff. And then we decide like we're gonna close. But the whole time we knew that we weren't really gonna close. Uh, EFW was gonna close because. The part, the portion of us that wanted to keep going in wrestling, we were going to go and get legit. 
but we wanted to we wanted to give off the you know the perception that we were just all going away you know uh-huh. what i mean uh so we like actually host a final efw show and like it draws pretty well and we do like a beer bash like farewell even though everyone's probably still underage at that time <laughs> and uh and then uh we by just, the way uh final pinfall on an efw show was that you on uh, the Duke, actually. Oh, <laughs> that's a little history I forgot. <laughs> and look at that. The final two guys of the square final off. Two. The final two guys that square off in an EFW ring the, are still. The five on five match, his team and my team. Still around to this day. But uh, so we decided that, uh, decide that we were going to go off and get legit. And I guess, you know, like I said, this one's already gone pretty long. So I guess we could probably come back to the legit part at another another yeah because that's gonna uh basically bleed into what becomes i guess your guys next fed that you roll you take part in which Which, is uh ccw which eventually becomes aiw so we uh we're just just getting started just scratching the surface here and uh but we're gonna leave that for you guys for the next episode of aiw's the card is going to change um, we're going to have a, a special guest on that one for you. I'm already very excited because he's going to have heard everything that was said here. And I, I'm sure he's going to be fired up. <laughs> so more on that. It's been a while. Cliffhanger. <laughs> Tune in next week to AIW's The Card is Going to Change. For Matt Wadsworth and John Thorne, my name's Steve Guy. We'll talk to you guys next week.